Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, good evening to those of you who are in uh, uh, Europe, and uh, I would like to extend a very special uh, welcome to Karen Wilcox. Um, Karen is the uh, director of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences, and at the same time, she's the Associate Vice President for Research um, at UT Austin and Professor of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering um, Mechanics. She's also an external professor at uh, Santa Fe Institute, and she also holds at UT uh, the Tex Moncrief Junior Chair in Simulation-Based Engineering Sciences and the Peter O'Donnell Centennial Chair in Computing uh, Systems. Uh, before joining uh, Austin, uh, she was at MIT for about 17 years, and, and MIT, she did a number of great things, uh, besides research, also doing a lot of things for computation engineering. Uh, she was the uh, co-director of the MIT Center for Computation Engineering and the associate head of the MIT Department of Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics. Before joining uh, MIT, she was uh, working for Boeing uh, Phantom Works um, and uh, working in particular in the blended wind body uh, aircraft design. Um, she has received um, several awards. I would like to mention um, a few, uh, one of them is that she's a SIAM fellow. Uh, she's also an IAA, AI, AA fellow. And I don't know now from the following two, which one is more important. She was recently elected at the National Academy of Engineering as of last week. So congratulations in person. And she's also um, appointed as a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for her contributions and services to aerospace engineering and education. And you may be happy to know that your prime minister of the prime minister of New Zealand will be the commencement speaker here at Harvard uh, in June. Uh, it's great to have you, and we are very much looking forward to your talk time. Welcome. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Petro. Thanks for the kind welcome and also for the invitation to be here. I saw the news yesterday that Jacinda Ardern was going to be the uh, commencement speaker at Harvard. So I just hope that she gets the country's borders open. So that she can come and then and then get back. Um, Maybe you have to, yeah. Not the other. All right. Okay. All right. So hopefully the slides. I'll take care of this. The slides are showing fine on Zoom and. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and they can they can hopefully hear me. All right. Um, I'm going to take the mask off to talk. Is that all right? You're the closest person to me. And I'll try to stay back here so that uh, we have a good six feet between us. Um, so it's not, it is nice to be here and it's nice to be giving a talk in person. Uh, I gave, I've given a couple of, of talks in person over the last couple of months and it's kind of weird getting uh, back into the, let's say, off, off the fully virtual world. So um, today I'm going to share with you some of our work in uh, learning physics-based models from data and uh, particularly the, the model reduction perspective. And if I can get my the computer back, um, actually, I didn't suppose there's a laser pointer kicking around here. No, that's right, we'll use the computer one. So before I start, um, I just wanted to uh, point out the members of my group who have contributed different uh, bits and pieces to the work that you're going to see today. Uh, so Yonat here is one of my current postdocs at the Odin Institute. Uh, Rudy is another one of my current postdocs. Uh, Chang is a collaborator who uh, has recently started as an assistant professor at the University of Kansas. Boris, a former postdoc who's now assistant professor at, uh, in San Diego. Parisa is one of my current postdocs. Uh, Shane is a PhD student at the Odin Institute. Benjamin, uh, who was a postdoc with me for many years, now assistant professor at Courant. Elizabeth Chan, uh, who was my PhD student. She's a von Kármán instructor at Caltech right now. And then Renee was a master's student in my group and she uh, has taken a position at, at uh, Garmin. So with that, Here's the plan for today. 
Uh, so just starting out with a few general thoughts about what it means to learn from uh, data in the context of physical systems. And as you heard from the introduction, I'm an engineer, I'm an aerospace engineer. And so the perspective that I give you will be one uh, coming to this problem of learning from data with an engineering mindset. Uh, then I'll talk to you a little bit about reduced order modeling. What is it? Why is it important? Uh, operator inference is our particular take on how one can learn from data for these physical systems uh, through the lens of reduced order models. And then at the end, I'll close with a bit of outlook. Um, and in the outlook, I'll give you just a little bit of a taste of some of the work that we're doing in digital twins, which I think uh, might be might be of, of interest. So I want to start off uh, with this slide uh, and with introducing you to the, the notion of scientific machine learning. So this maybe is a term that some of you have started to, to hear. Uh, it's a term that's been floating around for a few years. Uh, the picture up there in the top left of the slide, that is a report that was commissioned by the Department of Energy. Uh, and I was one of the co-authors on the report that uh, really tried to uh, identify what are the basic research needs for scientific machine learning. So what is scientific machine learning? Uh, it's really around asking what are the opportunities and what are the challenges of machine learning when it comes to complex applications across science, engineering, and medicine. And of course, the notion of scientific machine learning is, is really uh, there because we ask the question, why is it we can't just take machine learning kind of off the shelf, which has been demonstrated to be so powerful in so many other societal applications. Why, what, what is it that will go wrong when we take machine learning and try to apply it in the context of uh, challenging scientific engineering and uh, medical problems? And along the bottom of the slide there, you see some of the uh, particular attributes and the particular challenges that we face in science and engineering that starts to highlight, again, why it is we need to think maybe just a little bit differently. So of course, uh, when it comes to physical problems, we so often have physical constraints, conservation laws, for example, uh, symmetries in the problem, which are so important and so important to be respected. Um, of course, domain knowledge is, problem, is important for, for uh, any problem to which you wish to apply machine learning. But again, in the, uh, the scientific engineering and medical world, there's so much domain knowledge, and I'll talk more about this in a second, which often comes to us in the form of maybe first principle models that we would like to embed or that we need to embed. Interpretability is a big one. And again, uh, you, could, you could say that this is a need for all applications of machine learning, but it is particularly critical when uh, whatever it is you learn is gonna be interacting with a human decision maker which is, uh, I believe, always going to be the case uh, for designing complex engineering systems. I don't believe anytime soon that the human designer is going to be out of the loop or when, for example, uh, your computational modeling is supporting a human decision maker for a medical decision. So that interpretability is very important. Then there's the data and the nature of the data. And this is, this is a big one, this fourth one, which is, yes, we live in the era of big data. And people talk about the revolution of big data and the fact that uh, engineering systems have got sensors and data like never before, and that is true. And the data are big in the sense that it's gigabytes or maybe even terabytes of data that are being generated by these systems. But uh, despite being big, the data are sparse. They are very, very sparse. Uh, sparse in time and sparse in, and sparse in space. Uh, so, you know, pick your favorite engineering system. For me, it, it would be a, um, an aircraft or a spacecraft. The kinds of sensors that we have on board the aircraft are really giving us tiny peaks, small numbers of sensors distributed across the wing. And you'll say, well, okay, maybe it's just a matter of time until you can sense everything. But let's not forget that when we put a sensor on board an engineering system, it costs money, it adds weight, and it, it uh, has power requirements. So there's a real trade-off there uh, in the weight, the power requirements and the cost versus the information that's generated. So, so the, the sensing is, is very sparse. Think about scientific uh, and medical applications. And again, you would say, well, just give it time, we'll have more and more data. Think about the ocean. Think about just what we can sense 
deploying sensors into the ocean, we are not going to live in a world where the ocean is, is literally littered with, with sensors. The, da the data will be sparse. And when it comes to medical applications, think about the consequences of generating more and more and more data. We're talking about quite possibly intrusive and inconvenient tests on people who, uh, who may be sick. Right? So again, I think this is a really, really important point. The data are big, but the, the data are very, very sparse. And what's more, uh, they are almost always indirect. I know many people believe that engineers can measure anything. It's not true. <laughs> I, I'm going to show you some applications uh, in models for rocket combustion. Can you imagine how difficult it is to get measurements of what's going on inside a rocket engine with the pressures and the temperatures? Uh, even the, the simpler example of monitoring the structural health of an aircraft wing, which you'll also see, we can't break open the structure to see what's going on inside. The measurements that we as engineers can take are indirect in the sense that we have sensors and then there's gonna be an inverse problem to try to figure out what it is exactly we wanna characterize. And the same is true in medicine, right? You can't cut open somebody to see what's going on. We can take images, uh, we can run blood tests, uh, but again, these, these things are gonna be, be indirect. So I spent a bit of time on that fourth one because I think that's a really, really big one that has to be kept in mind as you start to think about learning from data which are again, sparse, indirect, noisy, and incomplete. And then of course, you, we now say, okay, we have this indirect and sparse data. And so it's kind of difficult to actually know what is going on, even if you could get enough data so that you have a good sense of what's going on. The game in engineering and in medicine is not about characterizing what's happening now, it's about predicting the future. Right? It's about playing those what if games. What if I fly the aircraft in this particular way? What will the loads do to this damaged structure? What if I uh, design this particular kind of treatment? How will the patient respond? So the game is to make predictions with quantified uncertainties. And almost by definition, those predictions have to go outside of the data that we have in hand. And what's more, we have to support uh, high consequence decisions that are not decisions about what you should buy or what you should watch. These are decisions about engineering systems, about the, the climate, about uh, medical treatments where people's lives really hinge on the decisions we make. So when you put all this together, it's kind of exciting, I think, to think about uh, what, uh, what different, different ways of thinking about the problem. It's exciting to think about what machine learning can bring to the challenging problems we have. But again, we really have to recognize these different elements that make our problems uh, in the scientific and engineering domain quite different to problems where machine learning has been so successful. Okay, let me just fix this. All right. Um, let's see. So I, um, I'm actually not a big fan of cartoons, and I don't usually put cartoons in my talks, but this one is just this, this one is just catches it so uh, so beautifully. But this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pull the data into this big pile of linear algebra. So I have to think my favorite thing about machine learning is that now all the students want to take linear algebra. Because when I was at when I was at MIT, all my undergrad advisees, we did not require linear algebra for the aerospace engineering undergrad degree. But I strongly encouraged all my advisees to take linear algebra because I think it's just like the most beautiful thing and one of the most important things. Okay, but you pull your data into the big pile of linear algebra, you collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the pot until they start looking right. And this is lighthearted, but uh, this, uh, we were at lunch with the, the students talking about just you know, the number of degrees of freedom in a neural network. And yes, you can fit the data, but uh, how do you know if the, um, if, if, the, if the model is right because it's so over-parameterized? And of course, there's a lot of uh, fundamental work and progress being made on, um, on sort of moving from this state of the art. But again, thinking about these challenging problems in engineering and medicine and in science, where the pile of data are not nearly enough and where the sensitivity to things like hyperparameters and not knowing whether our predictions are right are of such high consequence, this is, this is just not gonna, gonna cut it for us. All right, so um, we'll get on to the, um, some of the technical work in, in just a second. I did want to 
mention this uh, comment piece. It's just, I think it's two and a half pages long. This is a comment piece that uh, I authored together with my colleagues at Texas, Omar Gattas uh, and Patrick Heimbach, both of who uh, do a lot of work in the geosciences, where again, we sort of point to these differences and today I'm gonna to focus on uh, bringing physics-based models and bringing structure informed by the physics into the learning from data problem. But I do wanna mention that there's also another part of this, which is inverse theory and the entire field of inverse problems, which has a long history uh, and which, for example, studies things like whether a problem is well posed, um, you know, again, has sophisticated methods. And I feel that that's often a field that is, sort of ignored or people are ignorant of as they start to, to venture into to machine learning. So in this comment piece, uh, we drew out some of, the, some of those challenges and pointed not just to the, the physics-based models, but also to the field of inverse theory, inverse problems, and what that can bring to these to, 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 uh, to scientific machine learning. Okay, so physics-based models, um, maybe, maybe they're the answer. We've said that learning from data by itself is not gonna be enough. Uh, and we do have powerful physics-based models. For the last uh, five or six decades, the world around us has been getting built, literally built by physics-based models, right? This beautiful building you guys have, you just have to walk around and see all the incredible structures and recognize the computational methods and physics-based models that have gone into creating this space. Uh, so maybe that's the answer, but of course there's a big catch, which is these, these physics-based models are computationally expensive, and sometimes they're really, really computationally expensive. So uh, I've mentioned that we've started to do quite a bit of work in uh, rocket combustion together with the Air Force. Uh, we're still far, far away. We, the community, are still far, far away from being able to do simulations at the level of an entire engine. So the estimate is to, to simulate an entire rocket engine uh, a high fidelity simu simulation on high performance computing would take something like three months. Three months. Well, maybe that's okay if you only want to do one simulation. But of course, again, that's not the game. We have these simulation capabilities because we want to do many thousands of simulations, trying out different geometries, trying out different uh, strategies for the control or for the fuel injection, and uh, using those models to drive decisions. So at three months per analysis, again, clearly the simulation is not really a useful tool in the hands of a designer or a, de or a decision maker. So that brings us to uh, the notion of reduced order modeling. And so in the second part of the talk, I'll try to give you, uh, without getting bogged down in too much uh, details, but a little bit of a, a window into how reduced order modeling works. Uh, and again, reduced order modeling is a, is a I want to say old, but you know, a not young field uh, dates back several decades that uh, people have been deriving reduced order models as a way for taking these predictive physics-based models and making them faster. And what we're going to see is that reduced order modeling actually has a lot of very useful concepts that I think uh, give us a way to think about the machine learning problem in the context of systems where we have these, uh, these, these physics-based models. So uh, what is the idea with reduced order model? Reduced order modeling at a, a very general level, the idea is that you have a high fidelity physics-based simulation. I'm gonna say this again in a second, but uh, right now the, the starting point is that we have, we have a model. We're thinking about a problem where we have a model, uh, we have a high fidelity simulation of some kind, or maybe we have high fidelity experiments that we can generate data, we'll get to that. In a, in a little bit. Uh, now this, this high fidelity model has very large dimension, uh, maybe billions of degrees of freedom. And again, we're gonna see in a sec that it has large dimension because so often our models come to us in the form of partial differential equations. And when we discretize them, we get really, really big models. And uh, also it takes a long time to solve. So minutes, hours, days, in extreme cases, weeks or even months to, to solve that system. So what is a reduced order model? A reduced order model is a smaller system, smaller as in reduced degrees of freedom, uh, and also much, much faster to solve. So instead of hours, it's gonna be seconds or minutes or fractions of seconds to solve. And what's key is that this reduced order model is not gonna be found by simplified physics. 
It's not going to be found by coarse grids, but rather it's going to be found by mathematical queries of the structure of the high fidelity system and uh, derivation of the reduced order model in a, in a mathematical way. And how does that how does that work? It works by, first of all, a training step where we're going to have to solve or query that high fidelity model in some way to generate training data. And in the, the reduced order modeling world, world, the training data are called snapshots. These are going to be representative solutions, high dimensional solutions of that system. Uh, the second step is to identify structure. And that identification of structure, we're looking for some kind of low complexity or low dimensional structure. Many, not all, but many of the methods identify that structure through a low dimensional basis. So look for a low dimensional uh, linear subspace. Sometimes it can be a nonlinear manifold, but a low dimensional, um, uh, uh, a, lo a low dimensional manifold in the high dimensional space. And then what I talk about today, we're gonna to use uh, linear subspaces. And then if I stopped here, uh, I know many people um, in this program do a lot of work in machine learning. If I stopped here, that sounds a lot like machine learning, right? Training step and then identification of some structure. And uh, it is indeed, and in fact, I think that reduced order modeling and machine learning, even though they've come from very different communities, one from computational science, one from computer science, they are really in many ways uh, intellectual neighbors, even to the point that the methods that we use for identifying the structure are, are the same. Um, so for example, the POD, the proper orthogonal decomposition, which is the same thing as PCA, principal components analysis, uh, using the SVD. But with reduced order models, there's a third step. And the third step is really the critical one. The third step is where we now go back to the high fidelity model. And remember, we're sitting in this setting where we have a model to start with. We go back to the model, the discretization of the partial differential equations, and mathematically project it onto the low dimensional subspace that we identified in step two. And that third step is absolutely critical because first of all, this is the physics coming back in, right? We're not just sort of arbitrarily, uh, not arbitrary, we're not learning a generic model in the low dimensional space. We are deriving the model that comes from projecting the governing equations, the physics onto the low dimensional space. And, uh, if you are sort of careful and responsible about the way you do this projection step, there are large classes of systems for which you can actually come up with error estimates so that when you now take this projection-based reduced model and run it at conditions that were not in the training data, you get not just predictions, but also error estimates that tell you just how wrong that answer could be. So there's an awful lot that comes along with that third step, that, that projection step. And again, this is where I think reduced order model deviates from machine learning. And it deviates because reduced order modeling was aimed at finding these low dimensional approximations of systems where we had the models to start with. Okay, so... Um, I said reduced order modeling is not a, a new field, uh, but it is for sure. I think it's fair to say that despite uh, a lot of work and a lot of progress in the academic world, reduced order modeling actually has had relatively little impact in the real world and certainly much, much less impact than machine learning methods. And why, why is that? Well, this third step here, this projection, which I said was so important, is highly intrusive. What it actually means is taking a giant Fortran code, which by the way, the heiress my industry love Fortran codes. Not only do they love them, but they actually probably don't love them, they hate them, but they're bound to them. Taking a giant Fortran code that has existed in a place like Boeing or NASA for many, many, many years that is you know, built by many people, going in and doing these projections, which means getting into all the gory details of the code to come up with the reduced order models. And again, that might be reasonable if you're a PhD student and you kind of write your own solver and then you go and you do the reduced models. But this is a huge sort of barrier to getting technology, um, you know, to, to just getting reduced order models into the workflows out in the real world. And this is where I think we, the computational science community, can really learn from machine learning because if there's something that machine learning has done really well, it's to make the tools accessible, very, very accessible, right? The barrier of entry. Uh, in terms of the powerful toolboxes that are out there, many of them open source, 
when you can go in and you can get going very, 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 very quickly. And that's in contrast to the way that we've approached uh, this problem as uh, computational sciences. So, and what I'm gonna show you in our work, we're trying to bring those two perspectives together. We're gonna to go after reduced order models because this is a way that we bring the physics, we bring the domain knowledge into the problem of learning the reduced model. And what's more, we do it in a way where we get sometimes mathematical guarantees with what we're doing, but we don't wanna to have to do these intrusive projections. We wanna do it in a way that all of this can be done in learning from data. So you don't have to go into the gory innards of your uh, Fortran code. And uh, well, I'll, I'll step through how we do that in, in the third part of the talk, but just sort of put this slide in here just to remind you that as I show you the next slides, which are gonna be the ingredients we need, we're not actually gonna be computing these uh, intrusive projections. We're going to be using that as motivation for what we're looking for, but then we're gonna actually be learning the reduced order model from, from, from data. Okay, so we have to take a little bit of a detour and say, what is a physics-based uh, physics model? Uh, and it, I'm sure that for many, many uh, people who are listening to this talk, uh, maybe it's obvious. And then for others, it might be not so obvious. I actually began to realize a few years ago when I was giving talks, particularly to computer science uh, audiences, that we as engineers often talk about physics-based models and computer scientists have actually no idea what we really mean when we say that. So what is a physics-based model? Physics-based model uh, is often a representation of governing laws of nature that embed the concepts of time, space, and causality. And again, there are many problems. There are absolutely many problems for which we don't have good models, especially in the biological sciences. Uh, it's also true in, in, in other aspects of science and engineering. But there are many, many, many problems for which we actually do have pretty good models, or at least we have partial knowledge of, of the models. And I strongly believe that if you have a good model from the get-go, you should be using it to the fullest extent possible before you start reaching for generic input-output type approximations that ignore the fact that you have the models. Um, so, okay, that's it. That's fine philosophically, but what actually is a physics-based model? Often, but not always, not always, but often, these physics-based models present themselves to us in the form of partial differential equations. And I have one here, the equations of linear elasticity. So these are the equations that uh, you know, underpin literally the built world around us, right? The equations of linear elasticity that are used in designing aircraft wings. Uh, I actually don't know because I'm not a civil engineer, but I'm gonna guess play a big role in the design of all the, the structures around us. And what, what, where do these things, where do these models come from? Well, it's Newton's second law. We all saw that in high school, F equal MA in a particular form here. Um, things like relationships between the strain and the displacement and then the constitutive relationships there expressing the relationship between stress and strain, uh, you know, depending on what it is, what the problem is that you're solving. And then of course, boundary conditions and, um, and initial conditions. But the point is that this is a mathematical model that we can write down that encodes so much domain knowledge and so much information about the problem we're solving. And then what computational science has brought us are incredibly powerful, even if sometimes expensive methods to take these mathematical models and put them into the computer and give us then these predictive uh, physics-based simulation capabilities that let us play all these what ifs. What if I design the wing in this shape? Or what if I design it in that shape? Which one's more efficient? What if I fly the airplane in this way? What are the loads on the wing? Will it break? Will it, will it be safe? And what do what those models now look like uh, once you take the physical model, sort of run it through the computational science, the finite difference, finite element, whatever the method is that you're using to solve it, you're gonna end up with something like the system on the, the bottom of the, the slide here. Um, and so here, what am I writing? I'm writing a set of partial differential equations that have been discretized in space. And so now I'm gonna write them as a, a semi-discrete system, as a dynamical system that is evolving some state X. And what is the state X? 
this state is the physical quantities. In this example, uh, the displacements at all the different points on the wing in my spatial grid that I'm going to be evolving and calculating what do those displacements look like as I subject the wing to different loading conditions or as I, as I change the, the geometry. Okay, so in one slide, physics-based model, encoding what we know, mathematically it's going to manifest into something like the system that we see here. So now let's get back to what a reduced order model does. And so let's start with a linear system because it's just much easier to see what's going on. So I'm going to write my system that's linear in state in this way. And remember, X here is the state. This is the thing I'm solving for, the physical quantities. So the displacements on the wing, or maybe the pressures and the temperatures inside the rocket engine. And because uh, these things are, are infinite dimensional fields that are being discretized, the state X is really, really, really big. Think of it as having millions or billions of degrees of freedom. And what are A and B here? Well, first of all, U, U is the input, you are some inputs. So these are things that I could force the system with, different loading conditions or maybe different boundary conditions. And then A and B, these are now the discretized operators that came from those governing equations. And again, remember, A is going to be really big. A is going to be like a million by a million degrees of freedom. And now let's think back again to reduced order modeling. Remember what we did is we generated training data. We identified low dimensional structure in that training data. And in what I'm showing you here, we're defining a, uh, a basis V. So V now here is a low dimensional basis that describes a low dimensional subspace inside this big million dimensional state space that the original system evolved in. And V is going to have R degrees of freedom. So basis R, uh, basis vectors in the columns of that matrix V. And X reduced here, these now are the coordinates in the reduced space. So, right, this is nothing but a coordinate transformation into, again, a much smaller dimensional space. And uh, there's a whole host of ways to get V, but just for today, think about maybe the simplest one, which is PCA. I, I would call it POD, proper orthogonal decomposition. So, that's the SVD of my snapshots. So here's my approximation. I can substitute this approximation into the governing equations. And remember, the governing equations are those conservation laws, the physics. Now I have R degrees of freedom. I have 100 degrees of freedom, but I have millions of equations. I have now a residual. I can't satisfy all the equations. And so now here's the third step. This is the projection step, where I say define another basis, W. And by the way, we almost almost always, in, in many cases, take W to be equal to V. It's called a Galerkin projection. Impose that orthogonality condition. And then what does that do? That gets us to the reduced order model that you see at the bottom here, where now instead of evolving a million dimensional state X, I'm evolving an R dimensional reduced state X reduced. And what do you notice? You notice that the system I started with and the system, the reduced order model had the same structure. And that A reduced and that B reduced, which are small, are nothing but the projections of the original big A and the big B onto the subspace defined, defined by V. Okay, so it's, it's a very simple idea, but it says take a model, approximate a high dimensional state on a low dimensional basis, and then do projection to define a reduced model. And in doing so, you preserve structure and again, just to emphasize, I won't go into it, but depending on the underlying um, model, which means the properties of, of the matrices A and B and the nature of the system, often then you can, can solve this smaller model and get error estimates or uh, some, some kind of a, sometimes even an error bound, depending on how you do it, on, on the predictions that come out. Okay, so that's good, but sadly the world is not linear. Um, so we need to also think about what happens with nonlinear systems. So one thing I want to point out to you is that if I had a quadratic model, which means that my starting point is not just this linear system, but I'm going to introduce this quadratic term. So here, the Kronecker notation, this, this uh, x cross x here, just denotes all the quadratic, all the different quadratic uh, products between the elements of, of x. And h here is going to be my, uh, what is it, n by n squared. Think of it as a tensor that is representing the quadratic term. 
if we went through the same steps, which is to uh, approximate uh, X in the reduced basis, substitute in and project, then we get to the reduced model and you notice the same thing. The reduced model has the same structure as the problem we started, started with. The reduced order H is, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's nothing but the projection of that tensor onto the subspace uh, defined by V. So if you gave me an H uh, and I compute my favorite V, I can give you back an H reduced. And you can imagine that if we went to cubic, well, uh, cubic cortic and so on, that the uh, systems with polynomial nonlinearities, that this, this would be true. So what should you take away from this? Projection is a very special form of approximation and particularly projection onto a, uh, a linear subspace. One of the things that we're working on right now is uh, projection onto a, onto a quadratic manifold. But for today, projection onto a linear subspace preserves structure. And why is structure so important? Because structure is not something we imagine. Structure was given to us by the laws of nature. Right? The fact that our model has linear or quadratic or cubic or quartic terms in it are because those terms were there in the, in the governing equations. And I'll come back to that, that idea in, in, a, in a second. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients. Um, but again, I want to just repeat something I said earlier, which is, uh, so we do a lot of work with the aerospace companies and with NASA. And again, computing V transpose AV, it's very easy for me to write on a PowerPoint slide, but it would literally mean going into a Fortran code and trying to get A, which by the way is remember million by million, so A doesn't even exist. I'd have to try and get the routines to do A acting on a vector, right? It's, it's kind of a no-go. So we're gonna use all this, use these ideas, uh, but we do not want to actually compute these matrices by, by um, projection. So this is what we go after with operator inference, which says, can we get to those reduced models without having to touch the underlying operators? And again, I wanna emphasize, I don't mean to dismiss the importance of using machine learning for problems where you don't have good models. That's absolutely very, very important. As an engineer, I'm thinking about uh, problems where we do actually have a pretty good handle on, on the models. So we're given a physical or natural system with knowing governing equations. Models may be imperfect, but they're the best we have. And again, we have a set of data. And what I'm gonna show you today, the data are coming to us um, from these large scale simulations, but for sure, I think you should be able to see that the data could be coming to us from experiments, or we could be getting a combination of the two. And again, that's something that we're actively working on uh, in the combustion setting. And so the goal now is to infer a reduced model that not only recovers the data that was put in, but actually is predictive in the sense that I can use it to issue predictions about conditions that I did not see in training and do so with uh, some sense of the known, the known uh, confidence. And I give you the, the sort of end of the story up front, which is it amounts to solving a linear least squares problem. Again, did I tell you guys linear algebra is king? Yes. Yeah, linear least, so it amounts to solving a linear least squares problem. The linear least squares problem is going to be solving to find the operators that define the reduced order model. Uh, and there's a whole sort of set of ingredients that go into it. The physics are going to tell us what form of the model we're looking for. Uh, the thinking about things as a projection are going to be what get us into a reduced coordinate space. And like I said, also um, will sometimes give us a window into error estimates. Uh, inverse theory will let us understand whether we have a right to be inferring these operators and uh, whether there's some kind of ill conditioning or ill posedness that we might have to treat numerically, for example, using regularization uh, or introducing priors. And then because we are solving linear least squares problems and we can do everything amounts to being numerical linear algebra, we can do it uh, in efficient, scalable ways with off the shelf uh, numerical linear algebra. So let me just tell you, um, we have most of the ingredients. Let me sort of show you how all that comes together. And uh, I want, so, so again, we're gonna start with a physics-based model and we're gonna use this lens of projection. The second step in there that I am not going to go into in detail just because I don't have time, but I think is, is uh, one of the most fun parts of what we do, which is you should not work with the variables that are given to you the variables that you get in the textbook, right? You open your textbook 
and you'll see the equations of linear elasticity or you'll see the Navier-Stokes equations for uh, fluid dynamics, turns out that if your goal is to learn these, these efficient models from data, there are games that you can play with variable transformations to get the structure of the system into a form that is more amenable for learning. And this is something that the operations research community know well, right? If any of you have taken classes in uh, operations research and, and optimization, uh, maybe you know that the a huge amount of the game in formulating these, these uh, operations research problems, it's not in designing the solver, it's in manipulating the formulation. How do you introduce slack variables? How do you chain, use variable transformations? How do you write the constraints in clever ways so that you get a convex optimization problem or a, an optimization problem with known structure, and then you kind of reach for the generic solver? And I'll give you just for any of the fluid dynamicists um, who are, are in, the, in the talk, one example is in fluid dynamics, we work with conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So the variables that come to us out of our big codes are mass, momentum, and energy, or density, den some, sometimes the primitive variable, sometimes it's, uh, it's mass, velocity, and pressure. Uh, so mass, density. Turns out if we work with one over density, it's called specific volume, the inverse of density. If we work with specific volume instead of density in learning the reduced models, those fluid dynamics equations become quadratic. If we work with density, which is what comes out, I have one over rho showing up all over the place in my equations, nonlinear. If I do a variable transformation and work with one over density, then all of a sudden uh, many of the equations we work with become quadratic. So again, if you remember like one or two things from today, one is if you are, if you're doing any kind of machine learning, and I guess a uh, uh, machine learning person might call it the feature, feature engineering or thinking about what the features are, even in physics-based systems, we should be asking the question, what are the right set of variables to be working with that expose structure that is amenable to learning? And for our approach, we're looking to expose polynomial structure. And what we've shown is that you can take even things like Arrhenius, reaction terms that have exponentials in them and reacting flow and introduce additional variables and play games with the variables to expose quadratic structure. So that's kind of, I think that's kind of fun, fun stuff. And like I said, I won't, I won't sort of show you the examples. Okay, but we put all those things together. And then what does that mean? That means now um, I have defined the structure of the reduced model I'm looking for. So I don't need to look for a generic, a neural network, let's like say approximation. But rather, I can say, uh, I sort of postulate the existence of this reduced model that has this quadratic structure. And now that I've done that, again, I'm going to now pose it as a learning problem, an optimization problem that says, find me the reduced operators, find me the A hat, the B hat, and the H hat that give me the reduced model that best approximates the data, the snapshot data that you gave me. And... That's the optimization problem in the box down here. So again, we are solving, we're inferring the operators. We're inferring the A hat, the B hat, and the H hat that parameterize our reduced model. The things in blue here are the snapshots. So that's the many runs of this code generating the snapshots. Uh, we need to project them onto the low dimensional subspace that we computed, but all of that can be done again, non-intrusively. Uh, you'll see we also need to estimate the time derivatives. And by the way, this, this guy here is fraught with numerical difficulties. Uh, we, can, we can talk a little bit about that maybe in some of the questions. And when I say find me the, the operators that best match, we're going to uh, write it as a minimum residual statement. What does that mean? That means I've, I've uh, taken the snapshot data, substituted it into this postulated form, and then say minimize the residual. And the reason we use the minimum residual as opposed to minimum error is because now you can see that the things we're solving for, the A hat, the H hat, and the B hat are linear in this minimum residual statement, right? So this is nothing but a linear least squares problem where we're going to solve for A hat, B hat, and, and H hat. Okay, um, a couple really important details that I won't go into detail in in the talk, but regularization is absolutely key. Uh, other than for very simple problems, we cannot, this, this does not work unless you, unless you, you regularize. 
but again, that's something we could talk about in the uh, in the in the, the Q and the A, a if, uh, if you're interested to know more. Um, and then Benjamin has actually a very nice paper from uh, just over a year ago where he shows that if you are if you generate the snapshot data in a particular way, uh, you can actually recover the intrusive reduced model, and that's important because that's what starts to unlock those error estimators that I have mentioned mentioned a few things. Okay, so let me uh, let me quickly show you um, just uh, a couple of examples. So here's an example that's modeling uh, an injector and a rocket engine combustion, uh, rocket engine combustor. So uh, you're going to see this is just one injector, this tiny piece of the engine. Even so, uh, 2.6 million cells, and then several variables. So the density, the momentum. Uh, the, the energy and then the chemical concentration so that the high fidelity model is going to end up having about 20 million degrees of freedom. And again, this is, uh, this is a giant nasty code. It's a code that was written by Purdue University that the Air Force uses that we don't want to be, we don't want to be touching. So we actually don't even have the code. Our collaborator, uh, Cheng, generates data sets for us. And uh, just as an example, to get three milliseconds of simulation time, three milliseconds, which, you know, is, is, is nothing, um, takes about four and, a, four and a half thousand hours of CPU time. And by the way, this grid, I'm sure this, Petros is probably cringing because I'm sure this grid is terribly under-resolved. Um, so very, very expensive. We're, we're, we're solving here a tiny, a tiny um, slice of the problem we want to, want to solve. Um, again, I haven't gone about it in detail, but um, Using, using one over density turns so many terms in the governing equations into, uh, uh, into quadratic form. Working with the primitive variables, the velocity, the pressure, um, we throw in the temperature. Again, we could talk more about the variable choices, but again, at the pencil and paper level, we play games with the formulation to work with variables that are convenient for the learning. And remember, because we're not touching the code, because we're only operating on the snapshots, once you give me a snapshot containing mass, momentum, and energy, it's very easy for me to, to turn that into the variables I want to work with, right? Very, very easy. We're not talking about changing the original code itself. So at the end of the day, we end up with a giant snapshot matrix, 21 million degrees of freedom. We have 3,000 snapshots. And then we have an additional 2 milliseconds of data that we uh, keep out for testing. And uh, we, we have tons of, tons of results on these problems, both in 2D and 3D. Just gonna show you a couple things to give you a sense of, of how well things work and how well things don't work or how terribly things work. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at uh, pressure. This is for a 3D problem. The two pressure probes that you see, see uh, designated up there. Um, reduced order models with 80, 100 and 150 degrees of freedom. The black line is the original CFD code. The orange is our reduced order models that have been learned from data. The dividing line there at 18, at T equal 18 milliseconds is where the training, where the training stopped. And so what you see is that the reduced order models do a really good job of predicting the training. And then as they start to go into the test phase, um, they're actually really, they're doing a fairly remarkable job. And again, and again, we will see that pressure because of the nature of the, the, the physics and the, sort of the, uh, the dominance of, of the different um, way in which pressure changes, pressure is actually relatively uh, easy to get right. When we look at temperature, it's a little bit of a different story. So again, what we're looking at here, GEMS is the, the expensive CFD code, and we're looking here at a couple of, of uh, reduced order models. So again, in the beginning, we are in the training regime uh, once we reach T equal 18 milliseconds, we're now starting out, out in, the, in the testing regime. And you can see that temperature is much harder to get right. It's uh, with, because of the way, again, the physics is transport dominated. Um, here's a back-to-back -back comparison for a 2D, a 2D problem. And again, it's sort of going to be the same story. Pressure we do really well in. Um, in some of the, and I'm not showing chemical species, we can do okay. Temperature is really hard. You can get reduced models that recover the training data uh, as you start to go out into testing. I don't know, you could look at these and start to convince yourself that you're capturing some of the large scale structure. It's not really clear. 
But uh, for sure, our reduced order models that are learned only from data are doing just as well, if not maybe a little better than this guy here. This guy is the, is the state-of-the-art intrusive reduced order modeling, which by the way, took, took a couple years uh, for Michigan to get implemented together with this code. Okay, so uh, what, what do you take away from that? It is possible. There's still a long way to go. You can see that we're not definitely not nailing the predictions, especially for temperature out in the testing regime. Uh, so there's still a long way to go. And I think there's a lot more structure. And I think we also need some more sophisticated approximations uh, to, to handle these kinds of complex physics. But there's also a lot of evidence that if you really embed the physics in what you're doing and learn from the data in in a, a way that, that really respects those physics, it's actually pretty remarkable the kinds of reductions that you can see. And you can see on this slide, some of the other problems that we've, uh, we've looked at, a rotating, de uh, rotating detonation rocket engine, this is more recent work with, with the Air Force, um, where again, we have some early results that show that reduced water models with eight degrees of freedom, of course they can't get all the details of what's going on, but can really start to uh, reproduce some of the key physics uh, quantities that are that are seen. We're working with Lockheed on uh, fluid structure interaction. We've been doing some work with Oak Ridge on uh, additive manufacturing and some work in phase field modeling. And what's really important about all these applications is that every time we're working with partners, they've got massive code bases. And all we need to do is get is we need to know what the physics are, know what problem they're solving, and have data generated. Um, and then we can sort of put all those together. Okay, how are we doing on time? So I'm going to skip over um, this bit a little bit more detailed. I'm going to skip over and come to the to the uh, to the last bit because I did want to say a word word or two about uh, digital about digital twins. <coughs> so uh, again, learning from data it's kind of on every, everybody's minds. Machine learning and like I've said a couple of times, it's really exciting to look at all the new the new things that are out there and. Uh, I don't know, as an aerospace engineering, I do wonder how far neural networks will really be able to be pushed to influence the kinds of decisions that we make in, in aerospace engineering. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that computational science, and when I say computational science, I mean physics-based models, uh, high-performance computing, everything that comes from the ground up has a major role to play in learning from data. And uh, one of the places where we really see these things to come together is in the idea of a, a digital twin. Does, has everybody heard of a digital twin? Yes, I see. Has anybody not heard of a digital twin? No, okay, good. Um, so the notion of a digital twin, which by the way, has its roots in aerospace engineering. The term was, uh, the term digital twin was first coined in I think, 2010 in uh, a report that uh, I think was NASA, NASA report. So it was NASA and Air Force early work. And uh, in the 12 years since then, has definitely seen a lot of focus in aerospace engineering, particularly in structural health monitoring and sustainment for, uh, for military vehicles. But of course, what's exciting is that now digital twins are well outside of aerospace engineering. Uh, people are talking about digital twins in all different kinds of engineering, digital twins for buildings, for civil infrastructure, and then of course outside of digital twin, uh, outside of engineering, uh, digital twins for the natural world. So you may have seen Nvidia's CEO talking about uh, building a digital twin of planet Earth, um, and then in computational medicine. So one day us all having our own digital twins that can help uh, guide decisions about I don't know predictive maintenance or uh, digital twins for when we we get sick, moving towards uh, patient specific medicine. So I think this, the concept of a digital twin is so exciting because it brings together so much of what we do, have been doing as computational scientists, which is building powerful predictive models for complex systems. But by its very nature, the digital twin being a personalized, dynamically evolving model, which means that there's got to be this interaction between the predictive models and the data. Right? The models have to evolve, they have to learn from the data and be evolved, and in turn, then the models have to be uh, used to guide how we collect, how we collect more data and having uh, this two-way interaction. And then, of course, the third piece is using it all to drive, drive decisions. Um, so I won't go through this in detail, but this is the other 
other than reduce water modeling, the other main thrust of my research group. And uh, in particular, we've been working on how does one formally abstract a digital twin? Uh, we have used probabilistic graphical modeling, which is such a powerful way to, uh, to model systems. Of course, it's used uh, broadly in robotics. Again, we believe the digital twin has to embed the physics because we want the digital twins to be predictive. It's more than just knowing what's going on right now in my system to be really useful. The digital twin has to drive decisions, which means making predictions about the future. And as you can imagine, reduced order models have a really big role to play because if you're uh, wanting to, for example, make decisions in real time, you certainly don't have three months to go back and run the, run the, run the simulations to issue the, the predictions. So uh, again, using graphical models, and uh, one of maybe the, the most fascinating, this is now sort of me as a computational scientist, is seeing how these, uh, these broad ideas, the probabilistic graphical models, the reduced order models, apply to so many different uh, settings. So over the past five years or so, we've done a lot of work in uh, structural digital twins for unmanned aerial vehicles. That's a picture of a, uh, an aircraft that's actually in pieces in my garage in Austin right now. Uh, where we actually can run run tests on the on the unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, we are working, as I mentioned, with Lockheed and uh, moving towards digital twins that couple aerodynamics and structures with a focus on both design and sustainment. Uh, we've got a NASA project where we're building digital twins for hypersonic vehicles, really thinking about how to overcome some of the challenges of sensing for hypersonics. We've just started a new project in digital twins for space infrastructure management. You probably know that the, the, as the Earth has a looming massive crisis on our doorsteps with the amount of stuff that is going up into space and thinking about how we track what's there, how we manage what's there, uh, and how we manage uh, infrastructure. And again, I think digital twins, the notion of a digital twin has such a big role to play. And then uh, moving even outside of aerospace, uh, my group is collaborating with the Center for Computational Oncology at the Odin Institute in building a cancer patient digital twin. And again, it's pretty remarkable how the models that describe the physics models that describe how a tumor evolves, reaction diffusion equations, are really not too dissimilar from the models that we're using for rocket combustion. And it's the same kind of challenges where you have sparse indirect data, you're trying to infer the state of a patient and then issue predictions about how a tumor might evolve under different, uh, different treatment um, regimes to optimal control. So it's really exciting, exciting work. So with that, uh, let me stop. I'll say um, if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the things that I've touched on today, you can typically find a paper at my website there. But with that, let me stop. And if there are any couple quick, quick questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Are there questions? Yes. When you solve the <clears throat> operator inference problem, there is optimization and you look for operators. Do you impose any constraints on them? That's so that's a very, very good question. Um so yeah, you know, the, the answer the answer to every question is it depends, right? <laughs> um but yeah. If, the, if there is structure that needs to be imposed, then absolutely yes. And so one thing, I, I don't know if you have a particular structure in mind, but for example, maybe there's symmetry in your problem. Uh, so I actually got in kind of an argument with a reviewer over this. We don't actually have to impose symmetry. We can, well, we can impose symmetry through the way we pose the problem, because if we know the operator is symmetric, we only learn the top half of it, and we impose symmetry by construction. So there's some things we can impose by construction. Um, and other, other things that may not be quite so sort of straightforward to impose in that way, you could do, for example, by uh, posing that optimization problem over uh, a, a, different, a different space. And for example, I think Benjamin has a postdoc working on uh, thinking about it as a matrix manifold problem. So I, the way I showed it to you, we are just looking for the coefficients of, let's say, that matrix A and I'm really just treating it as a that linear regression problem where I learn each coefficient. But if you instead said it's actually a problem where I'm learning a matrix and I want that matrix to have certain properties, then that would in turn define some particular uh, sort of manifold in which you could pose the optimization problem. So, so the answer is yes, yes, you can. 
how far you can push that and what properties you can do in that way without making the optimization problem intractable is I think still somewhat open. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I should also add to that, you know, there are other things, for example, we want the dynamical system to be stable. And what we find is, especially in those combustion examples, you might have noticed that the signals tend to bounce around a lot. Uh, the operator inference, it loves to fit an unstable model because, of course, it's finite time horizon when you have snapshots. And you, it turns out you can fit bouncing around data really nicely if you don't have to worry about shooting off to infinity the moment your training period ends. And so we have sort of um, soft ways to encourage stability by including penalties on things going unstable further out, which we can do without training data. So we do play all kinds of games about, I would call it encouraging the models to obey certain, to have certain properties or to have certain structure embedded in them, even uh, without having to, to get to the point where you need more and more and more training data, because you saw how expensive the training data is. But yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Other questions, please. Yeah, so for the model reduction part, you mentioned a analogy with PCA. I know that PCA works exceptionally well for data where in statistics, it's Gaussian-like. By that, I mean the first, uh, the, the distribution is completely defined by the first and second moments. Um, so in your examples, is it common for the model manifold to have much higher orders of correlations in the matrix such that PCA might not be sufficient enough to capture right. the substructure? And how would you deal how would you with deal that? With this, is a, this is a great question. Um, and you're asking it from a statistical standpoint. And you know, I said PCA and POD are the same thing. I mean, they're, they're the same thing algorithmically, but of course the interpretation, depending on what it is you're trying to approximate, is a little different. So I, I won't ask, answer your question from the point of view of the statistics, but just from the point of view of, I have these trajectories in a very high dimensional space. Let's think a million dimensional state space. And I'm looking for a low dimensional linear subspace in which uh, I can explain the majority of those traje trajectories. Which, and then you, you're asking the, the question, you know, isn't there a large class of problems for which the linear low dimensional subspace is, is not good? And the answer is yes, absolutely. That was part of the talk that I skipped over. And you can see that when you plot the singular values, right? Because the singular values decay very, very slowly. And what that tells you is that if you wanna be able to explain a large amount of the data, you need that, that subspace has to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that the reduced model is not very reduced at all. So yes, there is absolutely a class of problems for which uh, that's true. Um, and that's in fact, I believe what's going on with those combustion problems. So, there are several things you can do. Uh, one thing that we have recently done is we don't build one single global PCA, but rather we uh, take the data, we cluster it, we uh, sort of use just a standard clustering approach, cluster it into key clusters, and then build local linear um, PCA subspaces, if you like, over the clusters. And I really like keeping approximation in a linear subspace because you saw how beautiful things are when you project onto linear subspaces. You retain so much structure and you retain the ability to analyze things. And I, so I like that localization strategy because it keeps that local linear structure. And then you have to, of course, figure out how you jump between the clusters and we use classification as a way to do that. That's one approach. Another approach that we're working on right now is instead of using a linear subspace, we have a quadratic manifold. Turns out that we can use that quadratic approximation and still retain enough structure to know what's going on. Um, so that, that's another area. But then I want to say one last thing, which is I have many of my students and postdocs, and of course they all want to work on neural networks. Um, who, who was I talking about? I think it was Michael I was talking about um, with that this morning. But um, yeah, there's a large class of problems which are not amenable to approximation in a linear subspace. But you got to make sure that you truly have a problem that truly is not amenable to approximation in a linear subspace because the incremental gains of making that approximation non-linear, just to get a, just a little bit more versus what you lose in terms of the ability to analyze and the robustness. And again, it's, it's hard to have mental pictures in million dimensional spaces, but just, just think about the full space being 3D, being this room, and the data points lie in 3D, and then we sort of have this, this, this linear subspace 
cutting through it, by making it just a little bit bigger than what it needs to be, we build in so much robustness. And so I think there's a real trade-off there. And I fear that people reach for nonlinear approximations, which are powerful, but will overfit the data and will lose so much of that structure. I, I believe people reach for them too early, but, um, but I love linear algebra. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a very long answer to to a more simple question. Yeah. Uh, questions? Yes. I have a, I, I can use you mentioned that a reduced model, a reduced model can give you an uncertainty. Can you unpack this notion? Notion it's in which sense it is? Is it like in the parameter space, or is it in the prediction space, or like what is the meaning of this? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I mean, of course, there's there's no magic here. If you want to have, uh, error, you're talking about the error estimators on on predicting outside of training. Of course, there's no magic. You only get an error estimator if there are certain assumptions about what it is you're approximating. So many of the error estimators will apply in parameter space. I showed today, I, I showed you things where we had dynamical systems and like in the combustion examples, we have an initial condition and then we're predicting out in time. But uh, a lot of reduced order modeling is around parametric systems where you'll be, your snapshots will be coming for different points in parameter space and you'll be building a reduced model that is parameterized that you want to use for making predictions at other, other parameters, right, other conditions. And there, the error estimators come because the, the physics, the, the model that you're approximating, um, and, and perhaps the, the, um, the most obvious example is a diffusion equation, right? You know that there's smoothness to the solutions, and you can exploit that smoothness. And by the way, not to make everything about linear algebra, but everything's about linear algebra, that smoothness manifests in the structure of A, and in particular the eigenvalues, and how the eigenvalues of A depend on the parameters. So that's what builds into uh, these, these kinds of, of error estimators. And, uh, you know, again, I can point to that there's sort of a whole um, sort of area of analysis that derives these, these error estimators for different classes of systems. You could get something like uh, a wave equation. So Jan Hesthaven, for example, has done a lot of work with, with wave equations. And there you can get error estimators but then, of course, then you can run into issues that effectivities can be high and it gets more challenging. So am I answer, uh, answering your question? But it's knowledge of the structure, which to, a, to many people is about the PDEs and the spaces the solutions live in and, you know, coercivity and all these things. Uh, but to a dynamical systems person, it's about the structure of those operators I was showing. And the more you can say about the operators, and it comes back to the first question about structure, the more you can say about those operators, not just about symmetry or, um, or uh, you know, other things, but about the parametric dependence and how things change and whether it's smooth. The more you can say, the more you open up the window to be able to get error estimators or some kind of quantification of the confidence when you are making predictions outside your predictions. Could it be a physical based error estimate, uncertainty based? So yeah. Physical, except that they're also uh, numerical. So I don't know if you're familiar with finite elements, but in finite element theory, there's this whole field of a posteriori error estimation, which is once you have the solution, so you have to do a computation to get the solution. But once you have that solution, then a posteriori, you can also derive error estimators. So it's, it's a blend of the physics and the math, but there's also some numerics that go in there. And then, and you know, how, how far can you push it? So the rocket, by the way, rocket combustion problem, there's no error estimators. And uh, okay, I know I'm being recorded and this is gonna go on YouTube, but I often say it, so I might as well say it again. Our job is to get the same wrong answer that the Air Force is getting, but to get it faster. Because the CFD code itself is not truth. And like I said, the grid is under resolved, but again, we're, we're gonna get to the same wrong answer faster. And then eventually all of this will come together and the models will get more predictive and we will bring in experimental data and we will learn more about the parts of the physics that we're not modeling well from the ground up. And, and at the end of the day, we will design better rockets. And then one of you guys may be going to the moon or Mars, who knows? It's exciting, right? So, so this last one, actually, uh, when you're starting to diverge from the CFD, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are wrong. Maybe they are wrong, right? Oh my gosh, GG's. Um, did you see this? 
this 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 plot here, I didn't sort of belabor it, but if you were watching carefully, so in this one, orange is gems, which is the CFD, and then uh, the intrusive sort of state of the art is the the black gray one, and then we're the blue. And like, here's the training regime. And then you have to ask the question, what on earth is going on with the high fidelity? And so then of course you say, well, you just have to train a little bit longer. So we train a little bit longer, but then if I show you the next one, and then, and then you really do ask the question, which one, which one is right? Um, and this is where, again, collaboration with the experimentalists, but by the way, experiment, experiments are not the answer because it is so hard to measure things for these kinds of flows. And now the measurements are gonna to come to us and the measurements, they, they have all kinds of you know, fancy techniques for uh, measuring what's, you probably know better than I do, Petrus, but the luminescence, chemical luminescence from which you try to infer what's going on with the chemistry or with the flow. But it is exciting to think about how you could put those together to do, to do better. And of course, truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I don't know, but yes, absolutely. The CFD is not necessarily right. Uh, I think we've gone way beyond the other yes. page. I'm sorry, I talked with you. Oh, right. oh, okay. oh, so I'll see you at 4.30. I pick you up. Where, where do I meet you? What is your...